Welcome to the third Building Resiliency for Health webinar hosted by Chemical Insights Research Institute of UL Research Institutes. Today's session focuses on exploring the impacts of extreme heat and human health. My name is Marilyn Black and I'm Vice President and Senior Technical Advisor here at Siri, and I'll be your moderator for today. We have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so feel free to submit your questions anytime through the Q&A section, and we'll do our best to address as many questions as possible after the presentations. If your question is for a specific panelist, please include that in your uh, question information. A recording of this webinar will be available to those that are registered after the session. Let's get started. I'm happy today to be joined by an expert panel. Um, this includes Dr. Alex Azan, Assistant Professor of the Department of Population Health and the Division of General Internal Medicine and Clinical Innovation at the Grossman School of Medicine at NYU Langone Health. And we also have Zach Calhoun, who's a civil and em environmental engineering doctoral candidate at Duke University and Patrick Chapitis, who's the laboratory manager at the Center for Advanced Measurements at, at Chemical Insights Research Institute. During our first two webinars in this series for Resiliency for Health, we've examined what it means to support human health in the face of so many environmental stressors, including extreme heat, extreme precipitation, and wildfires. We began by sharing this particular map, the weather climate disasters that have occurred over the past five years, each of which have resulted in over a billion dollars in financial losses. We'd like to start this webinar off with this visual just to remind everyone that we have a wide variety of challenges to solve and that this is a nationwide and global issue. Before I turn it over to our esteemed panelists, let's do a quick level set on the issue of extreme heat. Turning specifically to extreme heat in the United States, from the 1980 to 2024, or at least so far, there have been 31 heat wave drought events that have each resulted in losses exceeding $1 billion. You can see here that every state in the continent, uh, continental United States has experienced at least one. These elevated temperatures have led to a number of, of parameters, including a longer growing season and earlier springs, prolonged exposure to heat by people, and increased ground ozone mold and even growth of pathogens affecting our environment. We've also seen heat waves get more frequent and last longer during recent decades. You can see here um, for the different types, heat wave frequency, heat wave duration, heat wave season, and heat wave intensity, they're all increasing with time. And of course, the issue, this issue remains very relevant today. This map shows the air temperatures across the United States on July 10th of this year. Extreme heat events impacted the entire country, including dangerously high heat indexes in, on the East Coast because of high humidity, and extended power outages in Texas due to Hurricane Barrel, and staggering high temperatures in the state of California. So what do we mean by extreme heat? You've heard that mentioned many times. Extreme heat typically and specifically refers to prolonged periods of excessively hot weather with temperatures above what we consider average temperature for a particular region for that time of year, often combined with high, high humidity. In most of the United States, extreme heat conditions are defined as two days of temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or in California, it's three days uh, in succession above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. In the United States, heat kills more people than any other natural disaster. I would emphasize that this heat statistic is likely underreported and that the actual number is probably larger. 
Furthermore, this does not capture the heat risk of chronic exposure. Just last month, a new study was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that found that heat deaths, heat deaths were accelerating considerably, increasing 117% since 1999, and in particular, accelerating exponentially over the past seven years. In this particular study, you can see there are two different measures, but there is an increased uh, number of heat uh, related deaths over these two scenarios. So our panel today is going to cover how extreme heat does impact human health in the built environment, both the interior and the exteriors. We're going to cover what tools we have to mitigate these impacts and explore what solutions are available, including uh, at the community level. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Azan to discuss how extreme heat impacts human health. Thank you, Dr. Black. Uh, as we're slowly exiting the summer season, I'm sure many on the call are aware of how bad heat can make us feel, especially during extreme heat events and heat waves, as Dr. Black mentioned. Given the short time we have together today, I'm going to briefly summarize what researchers and physicians have progressively learned about the multiple ways extreme heat impacts our health and our health relevant behaviors. In doing so, I hope that this introduction can help ground our conversations today uh, in human health, health justice, and the well being of the various coexisting planetary systems that inform our health. Now, the, the association between extreme heat and human health is, is, is complicated and nuanced. And I often like to refer to this conceptual framework from the NIH's Climate Change and Health Initiative Strategic Framework in 2022, uh, because I think it does a great job distilling the complex mechanisms involved in extreme heat's impacts on human health. In short, this diagram shows how um, that climate drivers impact our health outcomes directly through extreme weather events like extreme heat, uh, which I've highlighted here but also indirectly through a series of exposure pathways as how extreme heat impacts our air and water quality, food quality, infectious diseases, and massive population displacement events in parts of the globe. These pathways uh, are themselves influenced by environmental contexts related to land use, geography, infrastructure, and agriculture, as well as social, behavioral, and economic contexts that create vulnerabilities associated with life stage, gender, poverty, discrimination, and access to care. Uh, in addition to the complexity of the various pathways uh, through which extreme heat impacts human health, there's also growing appreciation for the nuance in our understanding of the best measurements of how heat exposure, uh, of heat exposure that's most relevant to human health and well being. On the left of this slide, I've listed different measures of heat exposure that are currently used in literature. It's not an exhaustive list, but includes a few. Uh, that range from uh, ground monitor derived air temperature measurements, measures such as the heat index that Dr. Black mentioned before that accounts for the influence of humidity on human thermal comfort, and more novel measures uh, like the universal thermal, thermal climate index that also consider factors like wind speed and mean radiant temperature. On the right of the slide, I have uh, different measures of how extreme heat exposure are being considered in the literature, um, like temperature anomalies more broadly, uh, heat waves or extreme heat events that are anomalous temperatures over an extended period of time, and the consideration of factors like lag impact structures and employed models. Now, human heat physiology is a growing field of research that's improving our understanding of what extreme heat exposure does to the human body under di different atmospheric conditions and durations, and how these impacts differ across physiologies associated with different stages of the human life course. In general, exposure to extreme heat can lead to various heat-specific illnesses like heat rash, heat exhaustion, dehydration, and in severe cases, heat stroke. Uh, there are two types of heat strokes, broadly uh, speaking. One is classic heat stroke that tends to occur more, uh, uh, more commonly in vulnerable populations like older adults, infants, and persons with multiple medical comorbidities. Um, and then there's ex exertional heat stroke that occurs in athletes and outdoor workers. Uh, underlying these heat specific illnesses uh, is our understanding that when the human body is exposed to extreme heat for, long, for a prolonged period, numerous physiological uh, uh, mechanisms are taking place. 
Our, our thermoregulatory response kicks in with receptors in the preoptic uh, hypothalamus uh, area in our, our brain that tell our body to circulate more blood to our skin so that excess heat can be dissipated through evaporative cooling via sweat production. If the body can't cool down, eventually this leads to circulatory collapse as our body shunts blood away from vital internal organs like intestines, kidneys, and our like our intestines, our kidneys, and our brain, and that can lead to various uh, life-threatening health complications. And so I have this slide here just to uh, make more clear the different vulnerable populations that I just mentioned that are at risk for um, classic heat stroke and uh, other uh, heat-related health outcomes um, that we explore in the literature. And just to name them, uh, those are pregnant uh, patients, uh, newborns, you know, infants are especially vulnerable to extreme heat uh, in, in children, uh, elderly adults, and uh, persons with chronic ailments, as I mentioned before. And, and so in, in the epidemiological world of, of research, uh, there's evidence demonstrating that extreme heat exposure is, ex is associated with exacerbations of numerous other health conditions beyond just those heat specific illnesses that I mentioned before. Uh, on the left of this slide, I have a study from Dr. Perry Sheffield at Mount Sinai, uh, who's one of the more prolific heat uh, health uh, scientists uh, for children. Uh, and in this study, Dr. Sheffield and her team demonstrated that extreme heat exposure in New York City was associated with uh, heat specific illnesses, but also a range of other ailments like constitutional symptoms, physical injury, um, and ear infections in young children uh, in New York. Uh, the study I have mentioned on the right is a national cohort study in the United States um, from 2014 that's often referenced to demonstrate uh, various cost specific uh, reasons for hospitalizations in older adults who were exposed to extreme heat um, such as fluid and electrolyte disorders, renal failure, and septicemia. And so thus far, I've provided a very fast and brief overview of the complex mechanisms uh, through which direct exposure to extreme heat results in various human health outcomes across different stages of the life, of the life course. But in thinking back to the NIH's conceptual framework that I mentioned before, we also have to consider how co-occurring natural disasters like droughts and tropical cyclones and our built environment like cities uh, also play a role in the complexity of heat's impacts on human health and well-being. And so with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Zach to discuss ways in which our exterior built environments impact our exposure to extreme heat and its health consequences. All right. So uh, Dr. Black and Dr. Zhang just spoke about increasing heat risk due to climate change, as well as the risk to human health of extreme heat. Um, I will carry on the conversation by talking about how the built environment affects heat and pollutant exposure outside the home. When talking about the effect of the built environment on outdoor heat exposure, the, big the biggest effect is going to be a result of the urban heat island effect. This is something that I think we are all innately aware of, especially if you've spent a lot of time living in a city. And you can feel the heat in this image. The asphalt is radiating heat. There is no shaded relief from the sun and you can feel the exhaust from passing cars. All of these variables contribute to making for a much harsher thermal environment. Let's break down some of the physical characteristics of the built environment that cause this effect. But first, let's define the urban heat island effect. When, when we're talking about the urban heat island effect, we're usually talking about the relative warmth of a city compared with nearby rural temperatures. Um, these higher temperatures can be attributed to three physical changes to the built environment. First, land use. When we, collect, when we clear vegetation, we remove water vapor from the environment, which reduces the ability, uh, which reduces evaporative cooling. We also replace vegetation with asphalt, concrete, or buildings, all of which absorbs more heat from the sun and radiates this heat out throughout the day. Second, changes to morphology mean we slow down wind, resulting in heat or air pollution getting stuck in urban canyons. This prevents cooling and reduces ventilation. Furthermore, we often clear cut trees, which may act as a source of shade, and shade can provide a lot of relief from, from extreme heat. Lastly, human activity can be a significant source of heat. This image uh, right here is from an infamous alleyway in uh, Singapore, air conditioning alley. Air conditioning itself pushes heat from indoors into the outdoor environment, which can have a significant effect on temperature as well. Let's get a sense for the scale of this impact on urban temperatures. 
So in my own research, I've been looking at data uh, in Durham, North Carolina, where I uh, uh, where Duke is. Um, and this represents a fairly typical use case of the urban heat island. On the right, you see that the downtown red areas are a full 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the rural countryside. On the left, I show you what the diurnal variability of this effect looks like. We see two things here, um, much warmer temperatures in the heat of the day towards the evening and reduced cooling at night. Not only does this increase heat stress during the day, this, re this reduces your ability to open a window to, to get some of that cooler air in your home, which in turn makes us more dependent on air conditioning usage. These, these figures demonstrate that urban populations experience a significantly different thermal environment than rural populations. That isn't to say that rural heat stress is not important, but as the next slide shows, the world is getting uh, much more urbanized with a higher fraction of the global population living in cities each year. So climate change is making for extreme heat conditions globally, but this urban heat island effect is having an even greater effect on extreme heat exposure. Now, we've made it clear that urban heat is an existing hazard on top of climate change induced heat extremes, but which urban populations are most vulnerable. And when we talk about urban populations, at least in the United States, we often end up talking about traditionally disadvantaged communities. That is non-white, low-income populations. This is because of a history of, of white flight and redlining, which causes urban populations to end up being poorer populations. Um, and I'm showing here uh, a map of Baltimore, Maryland as an example. But as a, uh, as a colleague of mine down uh, at UNC demonstrates, this is pretty typical of most cities in the United States. Um, urban heat poses a particular risk to these historically disadvantaged communities. So it makes sense to consider how the built environment affects these populations. Uh, in my research, we've been interested in trying to get better data to look at how vulnerable populations are affected by extreme heat. And generally what we found is that the same neighborhoods which are exposed to higher temperatures are often the neighborhoods that are the, the least monitored. So what I'm showing you in this slide is a screenshot of a uh, popular weather website, Weather Underground, which uses citizen collected weather data to produce forecasts and map extreme heat. Um, there's a large gap in the network denoted by kind of the lack of dots, which you can see in that the center of this map. Um, and um, when you break down the weather stations by, by census tract, you see that the higher income neighborhoods are more likely to have a larger number of weather observations in them. This makes sense. Um, Cause if, if you're in a lower income household, you are less likely to splurge on something like a weather station for your, for your backyard. So in my research, we are looking for better ways to fill in the gaps, so to speak. So it, so, it may, so that we can better measure heat exposure at the neighborhood level. So I just laid out that the urban heat island effect makes temperatures more extreme for urban populations and that the affected populations are most often from disadvantaged communities. Besides the direct effect of heat on health, we should also discuss, discuss the effect of the built environment on outdoor air quality mediated by increased temperatures. So, Let's look at what higher temperatures do to air quality. When we think about outdoor air quality, we are often thinking about two major pollutants, ozone and particulate matter, or also called PM 2.5. Uh, we are currently on a trajectory of increasing air pollution as a result of climate change for a large portion of, of high density population areas in the United States. So we'll see that ozone will increase by one to three parts per billion, um, in a lot of uh, in these red areas and uh, on the, that left map and PM25 will increase by one to three micrograms per cubic meter um, in, in the red uh, region on the right. And if we take action to reduce climate change, we have an opportunity to keep air quality generally where it is now. However, these kinds of large scale studies uh, of changes to air quality aren't necessarily looking at urban environments specifically. They are looking at general trends over the, the scale of the United States. So let's consider what the potential effects of the built environment are on air quality mediated through this, this urban heat island effect. So we can reason that air quality exposure is worsened on warm days where the urban heat island effect is large by considering really two effects. Physically, we know that uh, heat acts is basically a catalyst to promote secondary formation of ozone and PM2.5. Um, so, uh, and I, and I know that the UL team is based in Atlanta. 
growing up there, I remember experiencing smog haze days, hit smog or haze days where ozone levels were at unhealthy levels. Um, this is a direct result of, of those increased temperatures. Um, and as we ex experience uh, more urban heat ions, we expect to, to have more of those smog or haze days. We also see secondary formation of particulate matter. Um, in addition, we have increased energy demand driven largely by cooling. This leads to increased dirty power generation. So to promote better outdoor air quality, we should reduce the urban heat ion effect and use cleaner energy sources. The second effect is a social effect. When it's hot, people stay indoors. This means their air quality is going to be even more largely dictated by the indoor environment, particularly a sealed indoor environment with reduced ventilation. Let's think a little bit more about that. So we are looking at these dual impacts in our, our research at Duke. We, if we look at certain urban heat island hotspots, we expect that there will be neighborhoods with higher incidence of heat stress, and this will dictate what uh, both their outdoor and indoor air quality looks like. So I know Patrick will talk a, a bit about a bit more about this, but in essence, we know that ozone levels tend to be higher outdoors, um, but they dictate dictate what's going to be going on inside the home. And ozone itself is a highly reactive chemical. As soon as it enters the home, it reacts to create all sorts of reaction products. Determining the health impact of these products is important for assessing the impact of heat on air quality, especially if we consider that more time is spent indoors during the, these periods of extreme heat. And as uh, the next slide demonstrates, some of the uh, more recent research at Duke has been looking into these health impacts of ozone, specifically as ozone enters the home and, um, and reacts to create these ozone reaction products. So um, while ozone is unable to necessarily penetrate as deeply into the, your lungs, these ozone reaction products are. Um, and and they, um, what, my, the what our colleague Jim Zing at Duke has found is that there's two proposed mechanisms for these reaction products to be carried deeply into your lungs. That first mechanism is that they, it binds to particulate matter and that, that PM2.5 is able to be deposited deeply into your lungs. Um, and the second mechanism is that PM2.5 uh, already impairs your lungs. So as a result, those ozone reaction products are able to, to get deep into your lungs. So this demonstrates the, complication, the complex nature of air pollution exposure. The air pollution outside the home can dictate what's going on inside the home. But now that we've moved into the home, I think it's a good time to transition to the next speaker, as, uh, as Patrick will be able to tell us a bit more about what they found inside the home. Thank you, Zach. As we've seen, the relationship between our exterior environment and the health and human aspects are complicated and still being worked out. As we move indoors, I want to demonstrate that series research is helping identify aspects of our built environment that play a key role in impacting human health as well in the context of extreme heat. So most people are aware that outdoor air pollution can impact their health, but indoor air pollution can also have significant and harmful health effects. Did you know that indoor levels of pollutants may be two to five times and occasionally more than 100 times higher than outdoor levels? You know, Zach mentioned the social effect of the urban heat, heat island making people want to remain indoors. Well, the levels of indoor air pollutants are of particular concern because most people will spend about 90% of their time indoors. And oftentimes this is even not during uh, extreme heat and uh, those sorts of situations. And so we must still think about about this concern with vulnerable populations such as school children, the elderly, uh, those who may be living in suboptimal housing where indoor air quality may be more detrimental to health and where sometimes these populations may not have the ability to, to go outside uh, during the day or uh, be able to, to relieve that effect. So why is air quality worse inside? We know that outdoor environmental factors like heat, humidity, and precipitation may affect the exterior structure of a building, but these may also affect what happens indoors. Additionally, products including commonly used building materials are major contributors to indoor air pollution, we are finding through our research. 
It's been well established that some building products off gas chemicals of concern like volatile organic compounds or VOCs. And we know that some, some of these products emit more than others and some in fact emit different chemicals than others. What we don't know is what happens to those emissions when the indoor environmental conditions change. Extreme weather, including extreme heat, is creating these new types of conditions inside of our buildings. So we might be facing prolonged power outages, which can lead to higher temperatures indoors. We might have damage inside the space, for instance, from natural disasters, some of which might require cleanup and remediation, oftentimes where precipitation uh, may infiltrate the home. We know that in certain regions of the country, folks are living without air conditioning, uh, either by choice or maybe because of a lack of access to well-functioning air conditioning. And finally, we know that extreme weather is creating new conditions. So we need to know how the materials in these spaces are reacting. So that's why Siri has been conducting research to see the impact of extreme conditions on building materials. And we term this material resiliency. So we're able to use our specialized exposure chambers to study how these new, new environmental conditions are impacting the materials inside of buildings. We're conducting research on the temperature impact specifically of indoor product emissions, looking at how these products behave at an ambient temperature or so-called room temperature at 23 degrees Celsius or 73 degrees Fahrenheit, as well as elevated temperatures, 35 degrees Celsius or 95 Fahrenheit, and the difference between these, these ambient and elevated temperatures. So the schematic below kind of illustrates the research protocol or research process that, that we're undertaking. We are, Taking these materials, for instance, uh, samples of acoustic tiling, perhaps sealants, flooring and carpet, drywall and paneling, as well as insulation. And we're using approximately a 25 centimeter, 25 square centimeter piece of the sample and placing it inside of the micro chamber that you can see here in the middle of the screen. Um, we are able to seal that up and collect the chemical emissions from these products and test them with gas chromatography mass spectrometry utilizing thermal desorption technology. And with this, we are able to ensure that we are capturing and quantifying all of the chemical emissions from these products. And we're looking, after we do this analysis, we're looking for two primary indicators of potential health effects. Those frequently detected chemicals across, across different material types as well as the chemicals with known regulatory and toxicity criteria. And so here is a snapshot of our preliminary results. You can see that the percent increase for total volatile organic compounds or TVOC and total aldehydes or TALD on the right, with the most common being formaldehyde um, when temperatures are elevated. And so from our research, we are finding that common flooring materials, such as the wood flooring types, different resilient flooring types, as well as the textile flooring, are showing the highest increase in uh, these elevated conditions. And these results demonstrate that our current certification process, um, whether through even through different uh, regulatory bodies or certifi certifying bodies, that use TVOC limits may not be applicable in expanding real world applications. And so, like I mentioned, one of the, the health factors that health effect factors we're looking at are these frequently detected chemicals across several types of building materials with the heat, with the extreme heat effect above normal conditions. We use this type of analysis to identify potential chemicals that need further evaluation for their potential health risk or toxicological concern. And from the entire data set, we looked at the frequently detected chemicals and classified them 
into categories such as irritants, and these included respiratory irritants uh, like octanol, hexadecane, renal toxicants like hexanol and dexanol, decanol. And then finally, those, those chemicals similar to PFAS, uh, and PFAS being one of those chemical classes that has been all over, uh, all over the news and, and public awareness in, in the last couple of years. And so the looking at the graph in the middle there, the y-axis simply is listing the chemical name and the x-axis is giving the number of detections within our complete data set across those building materials. And to take that one step further, we can focus on two new chemicals of concern that we found specifically from a resilient flooring material and these chemicals being benzophenone and neodecanoic acid. These particular chemicals had significant health concerns ranging from being ranging from carcinogenic and irritant properties to being endocrine disruptors. And these are unique because we didn't see them at normal conditions, but we do see them when the material is evaluated at the more extreme heat condition, which in our case, again, is 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, I want to emphasize that these types of temperatures have already been recorded in, in some regions. And so we're seeing evidence of these concerns that, that may begin to occur more frequently as time goes on. And, and I'd like to note that not only are these temperatures being recorded outdoors, but uh, indoors as well. And so this underscores that many of the certification guidelines that exist are carried out under conditions that may not represent these real world conditions. And a final example being toluene as a chemical of concern. Toluene exposure from resilient flooring is five times, was found to be five times higher at elevated temperature and 10 times higher when a modern home energy efficient ventilation system is applied. And if you look at the graph, all that ACH means is the air change rate. So think about it like a frequent, as, as the frequency of the air in a space is changed out every hour. And you can begin to see these types of emissions from, from building products can definitely affect the indoor space. And toluene itself is concerning because it is a reproductive toxicant and found in several uh, regulatory bodies uh, threshold guidelines. So this has just been a snapshot of a few chemicals, but we must remember we're not exposed to pollutants in isolation. We're exposed to a very complex mixture. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Zahn to discuss how all of this impacts people. Thank you, Patrick. In this next part of our talk, I wanna provide an example of how my own work that aims to uh, center human health in our understanding of the benefits of urban heat island mitigation policies in cities in the U.S. at the population level. Uh, before I share my work, uh, I want to share this diagram, which further details the NIH's Climate Change and Health Initiative Strategic Framework for Transdisciplinary Transformative Research. This figure demonstrates the different factors that need to be considered when designing and implementing translational climate health research in responsible ways. Primarily, I want to highlight that disparate exposure to various climate drivers like urban heat uh, are often tied to historic policies that have contributed to structural racism, such as redlining and exclusionary zoning. In order for our climate health work to be responsible, the, the NIH recognizes that we must perform global, cross-sector, interagency, and community-based research to ensure that the intended benefits of our work are in line with a shared and informed vision of climate justice and health equity. And so moving on to my project uh, that I'm currently working on, I wanted to provide some background information. So New York City is uh, unique in the US, but there are other cities globally that are just as dense as uh, Manhattan in particular, where across New York City, uh, roofs actually compose about 20% of the land surface area. And for that reason, uh, the mayor's office and the Department of Health in New York City are keen on uh, trying to 
develop and uh, implement uh, roofing interventions to mitigate the urban heat island effect that Zach had mentioned earlier. Uh, the three uh, roofing interventions that are commonly used in New York City are green roofs, solar roofs, and cool roofs. Cool roofs are, uh, in general, a darker colored roof surface that is covered by a uh, lighter colored surface that has a high solar reflectivity or a high albedo. Uh, and these roofing interventions uh, don't occur uh, independent of one another. They can uh, be mixed and matched on roof surfaces at times as well. Uh, Overall, though, cool roofs are the most widely implemented uh, roofing intervention to mitigate the urban heat island effect in communities that we call environmental justice communities in New York City that have historically been shown to be particularly vulnerable to uh, the urban heat island effect. Um, and the reason for that is because cool roofs uh, tend to be much more feasible uh, in cost as it relates to their, inflammation, uh, their uh, installation and maintenance compared to green roofs, for example, that tend to be more expensive. Uh, in the literature, though this is a, you know, a growing field of research, uh, cool roofs have been shown to have various benefits uh, around ambient cooling at the city level, especially, um, but some evidence around the building, uh, indoor cooling, uh, energy efficiency with reduced uh, use of HVAC units and ACs, um, and then prolongation of HVAC units lifespan, as well as the prolonged lifespan of, of, of the roofing material itself. And, and, and though this is uh, known, cool roofs have never been studied in relation to heat health using observational data in New York City. And so following that NIH diagram uh, for doing this work as responsibly as we can, uh, in, in designing our, our, our approach to understanding how cool roofs, which was our roofing intervention of interest, impacts uh, human health, we developed a cross-disciplinary team uh, with different uh, uh, skill sets uh, um, and perspectives that were we thought were necessary to do this. Uh, we have partners at different academic institutions I have listed here on this slide, uh, different stakeholder partners at the Department of Health and the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice in New York City, um, as well as the HOPE Program, which is a community-based organization in New York that I'll speak about in one moment. And so in New York City, uh, the primary way that uh, cool roofs uh, were thought to be installed across the city uh, was through a program called New York City Cool Roofs. Uh, and this was a program that was started by the New York City uh, Department of Small Business Services, the Mayor's Office, and the HOPE Program, as I mentioned before. Originally, this program was a volunteer-based program started in 2009, but eventually this program transitioned into a workforce development program in 2015 providing uh, paid transitional work, credentialing programs, and job support for New Yorkers that were uh, enrolled. Uh, on the right of the screen, I just have a, a, a sort of testimony from somebody who was enrolled um, uh, with the Kuru program. Now, I say that we thought that this was the primary way that cool roofs were installed in New York City. And so when we started this project, we first aimed to understand uh, how the program tried to prioritize communities most vulnerable to extreme heat in New York, to receive uh, cool roof installation, which they do free of charge. And so uh, my team and I developed this map in partnership with the mayor's office that basically demonstrates that the program does a great job. We're um, uh, in uh, the red colors, the darker reds represent communities in New York City that uh, are more vulnerable to extreme heat in the darker red. So that's in central Brooklyn and Queens, uh, the Bronx and Northern Manhattan. And then the uh, dot size represents the density of cool roofs installed by the program. So you see they do a great job. Uh, this compared to uh, another intervention in, in New York, uh, uh, green roofs, as I mentioned before, uh, does not do as great of a job where you can see most green roofs that are installed uh, in New York City are in more affluent areas in central and southern Manhattan and along the waterfront in northern Brooklyn. And so, uh, in trying to start uh, you know, our, our project, we wanted to make sure we had a clear understanding of the extent of the exposure we had of interest or the treatment we had of, of interest, which was cool roof installations. And so we partnered with uh, uh, a member of our team um, who uh, does remote sensing work, where he was able to identify uh, all the different cool roofs that were installed in, in heat vulnerable communities in New York City. On the left uh, is a map of a neighborhood in the South Bronx that's considered uh, particularly vulnerable to extreme heat. 
Um, and I, he has identified cool roofs that were installed in that area. And then on the right, we've color coded them based on the date of their installation and the mechanism that they were installed. And what we learned was that there are you know, numerous ways that cool roofs have been incentivized over the last decade for installation in New York uh, and have been able to sort of connect that to various local laws that were passed. And so uh, with that background uh, information that we developed as a, as a cross-disciplinary study team, uh, our project has two aims. I'll just focus on the first aim for the purposes of this talk today, which is to evaluate the impact of cool roof installation on children's heat-related health outcomes during summer months in these heat vulnerable communities in New York City. And so just to briefly share some uh, information about the project, uh, we're looking at a, a study period over the last, uh, you know, from 2016 to 2020. Children are our uh, population of interest, in particular, very young children and infants who are considered a vulnerable population uh, to extreme heat exposure, uh, particularly in communities with um, high heat vulnerability index scores, uh, indicating their vulnerability, which you can see uh, on the map on the right of the screen. And then we have different ways that we're defining our cool roof exposure. So uh, cool roofs, uh, just to be brief, are considered roofs that have at least 65% of the roof surface area with a sole reflectivity index of greater than 60%. That's to account for neighboring shading structures or like trees or taller buildings. We have definitions we've uh, created based on the literature that indicate dark to cool roof conversions um, and then cool to dark roof degradations, um, which is supported in literature as well. And then our unit uh, of interest, um, because we can't do building level analyses with the observational data we have, is to look at these associations at the census block level. And our heat uh, health outcome of interest in children, which is uh, will be measured as monthly rates per 1,000 children, are based on those different um, health outcomes identified by Dr. Sheffield's research in New York City using a similar data set um, of health conditions that have been shown uh, to exacerbate after extreme heat exposure in New York City. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Black to kick off our discussion. Okay, thank you, Alex, Zach, and Patrick for that great overview of the issues surrounding our extreme heat topic. Um, very insightful. So we're going to kick off this discussion and hope to uh, that all of you kind of chime in uh, during the discussion period with a couple of questions. And for those out there in the audience, remember, we'd love to hear your questions. So please continue to submit them through the Q&A section and we'll try to get to those as, as we proceed ahead. So let's turn back to solutions. And we heard from Dr. Azan about some of the solutions we're dealing with on the urban heat island effect. But I wanna to touch on solutions for indoor air quality in our spaces. Since we're all exposed to indoor air quality for extended periods of time and up to 90% of the time at um, when we're indoors. We know we can't have materials that can't emit anything because materials are made of chemicals and they are going to have some emissions. But I guess we gotta figure out how can we reduce the primary risk associated, especially with kind of the toxicants of concern. And um, maybe Patrick, you can tell us about some of the solutions that we might have to mitigate the, the impact of these emissions when they do occur with extreme heat on indoor air quality. Sure, so, um, and I'll just use uh, the graph that I showed on toluene as an example. Um, so one of, the, one of the solutions we have would be ventilation. And going back to that, that graph that I showed, um, with the less, the less ventilation uh, giving the higher emission of toluene. So, so the greater ventilation you have is, is better um, to, to reduce these chemical emissions. Um, and as you can see, yeah, the slides up there, when you have a greater air change or ventilation rate in the, in the building, you have lower, generally lower levels of chemicals being emitted from the building materials. Uh, we can also use filtration or air cleaning devices. Um, and then finally, uh, what may be kind of most important would be the selection of appropriate materials. Um, and that would be the materials based on 
the anticipated weather in that region, uh, the sensitivity of building occupants, um, and finally the ability to find safer alternatives. Um, and that, that may kind of sort of product certification may play a role in that as well. Happy to um, continue that discussion just a little bit, Patrick. Um, there are a lot of third-party certification programs out there that, addre that address indoor materials. And some of them are based on composition like cradle to cradle uh, and uh, others that are based on emissions like Green Guard. And I guess at this point in time, are you aware of any of those certification programs beginning to look at this impact of, of heat? And if our climate is changing and our indoor environment might be changing, any of those looking to think about how they might address their criteria for certification of these products for the indoor environment? I'm not aware at this point of any of, of the third party uh, systems using using these kind of new environmental conditions like heat. Um, as far as I'm aware, they, they just use standard temperature and standard levels of humidity. Yeah, well, so certainly looks like an opportunity, especially for manufacturers to begin to look at, at um, that impact that the, that the climate change might have on, on, these, on these emissions. And I guess maybe to throw this out to Alex as well, um, you know, if you're in the indoor environment and you're experiencing, say, chronic periods of extreme heat, you know, what sort of recommendations might you give, Alex, to kind of those folks in the vulnerable population groups of how to minimize their exposure to these elevated chemicals? Yeah, that's a, a great question, Dr. Black. I, you know, a few different things come to mind. I think first, ideally, if the temperature is that warm in the indoor environment, I would recommend removing yourself from that indoor environment if it is too warm and you don't have access to air conditioning. In New York City, we have a lot of cooling centers um, in, in communities that are particularly vulnerable to extreme heat exposure. So that would be my first recommendation. And if there's mobility concerns um, or, or functional limitations a person may have, there are it's a growing field of research, uh, 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 understanding what interventions may be best to uh, offer somebody um, who's stuck in an environment like that. As it relates to the temperature, um, turning on a fan, if you have access to electricity in a fan, um, there are parts of our body that tend to be more receptive to cooling than others, just based on where our vasculature is like cooling our extreme, our, our, the palms of our hands, our head, the, the uh, bases of our feet, but that's, that's a growing field of research. Um, and then in, as it relates to the air quality, I would say ideally if somebody is able to have an air quality monitor, an air filter um, at the grade recommended by the CDC, um, that's something that I would recommend as well. Thank you. Okay, well, let's let's turn to another important concept in safety, and that's kind of the unintended consequences. Unfortunately, we often see with the best of intentions, um, we still have some negative impacts. So how might this concept apply to extreme heat adaptation and mitigation? Zach and Alex, maybe you might have a, a response to that. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I can I can start off by talking a little bit about um, some uh, intended solutions to to extreme heat in, in New York City. Um, you know, just as uh, Dr. Zahn talked a little bit about the the Cool Roofs Initiative, um, there's also a tree planting initiative in in New York City, um, and that uh, the hope that you know if you plant more trees, you're going to increase shade and decrease that that urban heat island effect. Um, but but what some recent recent research has shown is that some of these tree species um, that are being planted emit more volatile organic compounds. So just as I was talking about how ozone increases on hot days, um, ozone production also increases when you have uh, more volatile organic compounds in the environment. Um, so uh, an initiative to decrease heat uh, has led to uh, increased concentrations of ozone in certain neighborhoods. So, uh, I mean, th that just means that the real, the, the, the solution you have to consider in that case is uh, we, we need to potentially consider planting uh, the right kinds of trees. Um, 
Yeah, that, exactly that, Zach. And I think the only thing I would add to that is um, as more science is needed to, you know, test and make sure that these different interventions that we're offering are safe for human health, like you mentioned uh, about tree planting. I know some of that work has gone into the New York City Cool Roofs program to make sure that the reflective materials we're using are safe for human health. Um, but I think generally uh, what these unattended consequences uh, you know, make clear is that uh, for any uh, policy initiative that is related to our, our climate and, and our built environments, we need to make sure that we have robust research design so that we can monitor and evaluate that those policies have the intended outcomes that they aim to have. Um, because if you don't see a, a reduction or a change in uh, the frequency of heat-related illnesses in the in these communities that you're providing these interventions in, it means that either something unintentionally bad is happening or it's not having the effect um, uh, that you're hoping that it has. So uh, yeah, that's what I'd say. Okay, great. Well, um, thinking back, um, kind of to our existing solutions that we have and uh, would like to hear from you guys on I mean where where are we where do they fall short um, and um, what are we dealing with and how might we advance advance them for uh, effectiveness All right so I, I cannot give one answer to this um, I'm, so I think uh, if you think about one of the primary adaptation strategies that we rely on um, is, is air conditioning to make sure that we can keep ourselves cool uh, when it gets really hot. Um, and if we have a changing climate, we are relying on air conditioning more. So uh, not only do are we using air conditioning more in you know the southeast where, where I'm based out of, you're, you're seeing air conditioning usage expand um, further north uh, as well. So we have increased energy demand uh, as a result of um, trying to meet you know these warmer temperatures, which uh, kind of, which which poses a huge risk to our our climate goals, right? As we seek to, to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, um, and and I think the the second thing I'd say um, about air conditioning is that if we're if we're overly dependent on on air conditioning to to cool ourselves, then we are at risk of um, being um, exposed to extreme heat if, if air conditioning fails. Uh, and there was a the air, just as we, we talked about Hurricane Barrel earlier uh, in the presentation, Hurricane Barrel wiped out the grid in Texas uh, for a few days. So we had uh, the hurricane came in and then we had an immediate um, uh, heat wave following that event. And, and that left thousands of, of people without air conditioning for an extended period of time. And some of the research uh, analyzing that, that event has, has already shown that that there was a higher incidence of mortality um, and, and hospital rates or hospital visits during that period of time. Yeah, Alex, I, do you have anything to contribute to that? Thanks, Dr. Black. Yes, I, what I would add is that I, I think when we contextualize uh, the different adaptation solutions that are being developed, both those that are energy dependent and energy independent, uh, I think a concern in the global climate health community is that uh, as our uh, climate continues to warm, um, you know, the primary goal is mitigation, but even if we uh, achieve net zero, there'll be latent warming. And so how do these adaptation interventions fare under the more extreme warnings, uh, warming scenarios that are projected, uh, especially in parts of the globe that are uh, uh, particularly vulnerable to that, like in, you know, the Middle East, Bangladesh, um, South Asia, um, even parts of, of this country in Mexico? Um, there's not a lot of research that demonstrates how green infrastructure and cooling infrastructures um, fare under more extreme dry and human heat scenarios projected for our, uh, our climate. Okay, thank you. And I think the last um, the last question I have before we go to the audience Q&A is um, really like to hear from all of you in terms of what do you see the future and um, the, the issues that we have with extreme heat and public health efforts. Um, what's, com what's coming next? What sort of research? What sort of solutions? What, what really excites you uh, from the standpoint of, of looking how we can reduce health risk? For that first. Uh, I can 
start by answering that. I think, uh, you know, I see a lot of different uh, directions for the future of extreme health, uh, heat research and public health. Uh, I think the uh, intersectionality of this work that's coming about in collaborations uh, is encouraging because I think it allows us to bring together different skill sets to really understand all of those different uh, complex dynamics of how extreme heat impacts our health across different life stages, across different uh, uh, levels of comorbidity. Um, so I would say that first. And I can uh, I can follow up uh, on that that answer from Dr. Zahn by by just saying you know we're trying to create our in in my field as an engineer you know we're trying to model uh, heat exposure and, and and so that we can pass off that that high spatial resolution heat exposure data to someone like an environmental epidemiologist who can then take that high resolution high resolution exposure data and tie it to health outcomes and that's going to help us really better understand. Uh, how populations are being impacted by extreme heat. And finally, from my perspective, um, we're from the kind of ground level of, of expand, we're expanding emissions research, um, you know, looking at a wider range of building materials and an answer to one of the Q and A questions, we, we are beginning to look at humidity effects um, as in addition to heat, uh, because oftentimes especially in different regions, uh, those will, will work synergistically. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we are ready to go to the audience right now. I'm not seeing any particular questions coming in from the audience. So if you've got a burning question, be sure and put it in the uh, Q and A box that would be great um oops i just saw one i just saw one go by uh trying to rec trying to recover it <laughs> i can uh i can start by answering two questions i think i saw came in related to what i presented okay uh, go ahead so the first question i think was uh from benjamin where he asked uh, was there any monitoring of the decrease in energy costs for buildings that installed cool or green roofs uh, in New York City? Uh, I am not uh, intimately familiar with the details of that work, but I do know that the mayor's office uh, of climate change and environmental justice and their Department of Small Business Services did do um, some preliminary pilot work uh, uh, that have put numbers to how uh, much on average uh, cool roof installation reduced um, HVAC use and energy costs uh, for buildings and uh, energy equity is a big uh, 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 focus of uh, the mayor's office of climate change and environmental justice. And I know that there, there's ongoing work there as well. Um, and then the second question I saw come in was from Gabrielle, um, where they had asked, what are some of the policy solutions uh, those partners are recommending I think that it may be related to uh, the partners that we have involved in uh, our cool roof project. Um, I think beyond cool roof installation, other policy solutions, there's so many uh, here in New York City right now uh, related to, uh, you know, updating building codes and making sure that we're, we have local laws that both incentivize the installation and maintenance of these different roofing interventions to mitigate the urban heat island effect. Um, I can talk uh, offline, Gabby, uh, Gabrielle, if you'd like, uh, in more detail about those local laws, if you'd like. Um, there's also uh, interesting sort of funding solutions that uh, I know our city is working on uh, uh, as it relates to how we can build uh, uh, sort of financial incentives for this work in, in various policies in the city as well that I can speak to more in detail at a later time, if you'd like, Gabrielle. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead, Patrick. I saw I saw one question concerning the air pollution studies, and heat is one thing, but what about humidity? And and are you planning on conducting more studies looking at higher humidity, which can affect probably the chemical emissions pretty significantly? Yes. Um, yeah, and I think I may have just briefly answered that one. Um, I think it was from Ho Young Lee. Uh, yes, we are. 
going to consider humidity for uh, our ongoing research. Okay, well that that that'll be interesting to look at both increased temperature and and humidity and what 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 that might do because I do know that increased humidity changes and increases formaldehyde emissions, especially from uh, manufactured wood products pretty significantly. So I think our time is just about up. We certainly appreciate all of you attending today's webinar. We hope it has helped answer some of the questions that you had and also enlightened you on the kind of the threat that we are beginning to experience from our extreme weather events and uh, look forward to sharing more information with you. And I encourage all of you to reach out to these three uh, wonderful speakers that we had today if you have any more questions on these topics. So thank you very much.